When this is Iyad Murtada, and I would like to welcome you here all uh, today on behalf of the IMA Dubai uh, UAE chapter. Today we have with us a very special guest, Mr. Jeffrey Thompson, the president and CEO of the IMA. And today our presentation is going to be a really interesting presentation related to management accountants enhancing organization uh, capability in the turbulent times. Today our presentation is going to go for about like 15 minutes and after that we are going to have some questions. You can type your questions and answers in the box in front of you and after that we will answer them at the end of the presentation and please make sure to answer the three questions that we are going to have in the presentation for you to be able to get the CBE credits. Now I'm going to give the microphone to Mr. Uh, Jeff to speak. Hello everyone, uh, it's Jeff Thompson, President and CEO of the IMA. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Uh, thank you, Iyad, for uh, facilitating this. Uh, I want to welcome you as members of either the Dubai chapter or the Abu Dhabi chapter. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again in the region. Once again, you are so important to the success and vitality of IMA globally and in the region. So as he had said, we're going to spend about uh, 40 minutes or so. Hopefully uh, my voice is clear. If not, you'll let us know. But we're going to spend about uh, 45 minutes or so talking about management accountants and their role in enhancing organizational capability in turbulent times. Um, and I've got three main themes that are going to permeate the uh, presentation. We'll, we'll pull up the agenda in just a moment. But first, the three main themes. Number one, especially in turbulent times, organizations look to their help ride them through the turbulence. Uh, we become the go-to people. Is the balance sheet healthy? What does our cash flow look like? Where can we reallocate investments and optimize our portfolio, both internal and external resources? What about access to capital and financing? So first theme is, especially in turbulent times, we are the go-to people. The second major theme is the fact that organizations are always looking to differentiate themselves uh, to, in order to create and sustain growth, whether that's innovation, whether that's hiring the right talent, uh, whether that's process improvements. So second major theme, in these turbulent times, in a highly competitive environment, organizations around the world are looking to differentiate themselves. Theme number three is at the individual level, and it's about individual differentiation. How can we, as management accountants, not only differentiate ourselves, but increase organizational capability? And that's all around our own ROI, return on individual, in terms of certification and training and keeping our competencies up to date. And so third theme, individual differentiation. So let's get right into the uh, agenda. We're going to uh, talk about the theme of CMA being trusted business advisor. First, we're going to look outside the market and talk about what CFOs are saying, um, what, what our customers are saying. What about global economic conditions? Uh, what implications do they have? And then we're going to touch on four domain areas very quickly, you know, in 45 or 50 minutes, I could spend two or three hours on each one of these topics. Uh, but these are areas very critical to organizational success, very critical to individual differentiation, risk management and internal controls, planning, budgeting and forecasting, strategic cost management and leadership, the soft skills, the influencing skills. So, uh, the first question uh, for you to be thinking about, and uh, perhaps when we do the Q&A, uh, it's, it's interesting to understand what are finance professionals here saying are the most pressing issues, and what are they saying about the economy in the future? Now, we did have a, a live event here in, uh, at Open Thinking, and we got some interesting responses around uh, the most pressing issues, access to capital. Uh, the need to trim costs very rapidly in certain industry verticals. The general feeling about the economy in the future is not all that positive, uh, still some concern about uh, customer demand and access to capital, 
Of course, that will vary by uh, industry sector. Some sectors are better off and more resilient than others. Telecommunications tends to be a tough sector. Um, certainly travel with the uh, tourism, with the Arab Spring. Other sectors are a bit more resilient, like utilities and infrastructure, as well as professional services. So be thinking about that uh, during the Q&A so that we can, um, you know, we can tailor the conversation. In the next slide, slide four, it's very clear that CFOs aspire to do more decision support. Make no mistake about it, transaction processing, closing the books, statutory, regulatory, financial reporting, all very important, all vital to an organization's success. But the reality is that in terms of 100% of your time, on the far right, the aspiration of CFOs when asked through this IBM study is they'd like to really be spending 40% of their time on decision support, FP&A, risk, M&A, new product development. And the reality is that on average, they're spending uh, only about 26% of their time on decision support. If you look down below, the aspiration on the far right is that they spend a third or less than a third of their time on transactional types of activities. And right to the left, about 50% of their time uh, in reality is spent on transaction processing. So that is uh, very important because as management accountants, as CMAs in industry, we're expected to do both in many cases, to do decision support and forward-looking type of stuff while making sure that we can properly represent the historical records of the enterprise. So hopefully so far so good. Uh, yeah, did we want to make any mention of the uh, uh, passing of the CMA exam? Yeah, it looks like most of you here today with us, uh, you, uh, you passed the CMA exam, so you understand exactly the value of the CMA exam. And when, once you, you know, go and understand most of this concept, you will be able to really play a really important role in your organization in pushing all these you know, ideas through the organization. Great, thank you. And uh, congratulations for the 75.68% uh, of you who passed, <laughs> passed the CMA exam. So the next three slides, we're, we're still, so we, we talked a little bit about what CFOs are saying. Uh, the next three or so slides, we're going to be very broad from an environmental perspective, you know, to understand the context in which individual organizations operate or individual professionals operate, it's important to understand the big picture. So I won't read every word on slide five, but um, if in fact we're beginning to rebound a bit uh, from the global economic uh, crisis, um, typically merger and acquisition activity picks up. And the thing to be thinking about when you look at these environmental trends, uh, whether you keep up with uh, The Economist or Forbes magazine or the IMA, be thinking about how this translates into skill sets that perhaps you want to learn or relearn. So if I read that M&A activity could be increasing and more purchasing is going on and business combinations, that might be a, a good opportunity to dust off that part of the CMA exam and even go beyond the CMA exam and uh, build up my M&A activity. There was a recent Ernst & Young study that said if you aspire to be the CFO of the enterprise, you better have had some direct M&A um, experience and activity. Uh, the second bullet from the last, uh, the linkage between the management accountant and the ITIS professional. Uh, more successful organizations and more successful professional accountants understand how to access internal data, understand how to use internal data to help make business decisions, and we refer to that as uh, data mining and business intelligence. And then the last bullet is very interesting, and we see this even with accounting associations. A wide mix of alliance and partnership arrangements means former rivals who were competitors they might actually join together in some markets. They may compete in others. So from a skill set perspective, be thinking about strategic partnering. Be thinking about, as I said earlier, M&A type of activity. And this is definitely higher order management accounting type of activity, but it's certainly an activity that you want to be well versed in. 
Uh, terms of information systems on slide six, uh, smart technology, the ability to access more data and analytics. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with customer co-creation and crowdsourcing, but that's all around, around the innovation cycle. Uh, innovation, the greatest innovations of our time from a technology perspective and a customer servicing perspective never come from a, a group of supposedly smart corporate executives thinking about the next best thing. Typically, the best inventions, the best innovations in the world come through the crowd, the customer, the customer saying this experience of registering, this experience of making an airplane reservation uh, is unacceptable. I'm going to develop a solution for somebody to think through and develop. That's the innovation cycle. And of course, smart devices. Um, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have uh, exam questions and flashcards right on your local device as an example in uh, management accounting and management accounting training? Sustainability, of course, in addition to the societal benefits of sustainability and carbon footprint and clean tech, management accountants, this area is becoming an incredible increasing area of emphasis that we need to step up to with the appropriate skill sets. When you think about it, more and more CFOs around the world have become accountable, not just for the pure financial results, the balance sheet, the income statement, the cash flow, sources and uses, but also for quote unquote non-financial reporting, carbon footprint, donation to social causes, employee retention, that more balanced view of business performance. Well, guess what? The CFO and the management accountant more and more are being asked to report those measures accurately, to report those measures in a leading indicator way and not just a, leading, a lagging indicator. And finally, to report these results with the appropriate level of risk management and internal controls. By the way, what I just described is known as integrated reporting. We have partnered with um, the ACCA, as many of you know. Uh, the ACCA is uh, the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants based in the UK. We did a, uh, a quarterly survey with them, uh, fourth quarter of 2011. It was the largest survey of its kind, nearly 4,000 professional accountants. And unfortunately, at least through uh, quarter four uh, of last year, there's a, a little bit of a, a dismal feeling uh, around stagnating global economy. You know, the global economy is so interconnected today that problems in, in the U.S. become global problems in terms of international trade. Problems in Europe uh, and Greece and Italy that were very isolated regional problems become problems from an international trade perspective. In the Middle East, uh, not a whole lot of confidence uh, relative to the prior quarter. Interestingly enough, in the UAE, uh, the impact of government, government spending is expected to increase, and they believe that this investment will help to sustain, uh, will be a positive development. In the US, when the government spends more money on stimulus packages and whatnot, it's not typically viewed as a positive but here in the UAE, perhaps there's more confidence that the government will uh, sustain and, and help to create economic turnaround. And by the way, I just read this morning that in Dubai, the Dubai financial markets, uh, the general index is up 22% since the beginning of the year. So maybe conditions at least locally are improving. Okay, so let's talk about some of the domains that I alluded to. Just as a very quick reminder, uh, many of you are already CMAs. But the CMA exam is a rigorous, relevant, and focused two-part exam. Each part of the exam is five knowledge domains that are on the screen uh, with over 500 learning outcome statements. So that's part one. Part two is a little bit more uh, corporate finance. As you know, whether you took the four-part exam or the two-part exam, the CMA curriculum has always been a hybrid between pure accounting and finance and corporate financial management. Okay, so let's talk a bit about risk management. And again, 
these are areas that um, I can spend literally hours, if not days, in a workshop. There's so many. There's so much rich knowledge um, and risk management with the global economic crisis and financial frauds and uh, competitive uh, pressures, technological advancements, customers becoming more sophisticated. Risk management has moved way up in terms of a key area of responsibility for the chief financial officer, and then it's become growing. Uh, it's growing in terms of its uh, stature among management accountants and need to understand what risk management entails. You know, if I had to capture risk management and speak from one slide, um, this probably would be it. It's very oversimplified. But the bottom line is that risk management by itself cannot be successful. And by the way, risk management is not just the historical definition of financial risk, currency risk, hedging, treasury, cash. Nowadays, when we talk about risk management, we're talking about enterprise risk management, uh, competitive risk, product obsolescence risk, technology risk, competitive risk succession planning risk, et cetera, et cetera. Literally, enterprise risks that impact the achievement of strategic objectives. And that's why in this little um, circular diagram, it starts with setting strategy and objectives. You identify risks and opportunities to achieving those uh, objectives. If you go further down, you see things like treating risk and assessing risk. What this means is that if you have a significant residual risk to achieving a particular strategic goal or KPI, you want to come up with mechanisms to treat the risk. Uh, one way to treat the risk is to ignore it um, because you don't believe it's going to become significant. Another way to treat the risk is to implement an internal control. For example, if you have a small office and you think there's a risk of fraudulent activity, then you implement a method called segregation of duties where the person authorizing the voucher cannot also be the person signing off on the voucher. That's a very, very simple example. But in treating risk, there's another type of treatment and that's called exploiting the risk for opportunity. Um, you know, the IMA is under some uh, heavy competition. We're doing well, but with the AICPA and SEMA launching a global management accounting credential, while that's a risk that we must treat, it could also be a significant opportunity for our association to grow and advance the profession of management accounting. And then the latter steps here are to uh, communicate and monitor the risk on an ongoing basis relative to the achievement of strategic objectives. Now what I just described sounds easy. On paper, it looks good. But even in the most mature of economies like the US, like the UK, um, we still haven't figured out how to implement enterprise risk management because it's complicated. You're talking about uh, talking about risk in a constructive way, not in a destructive way. You're talking about uh, creating a whole culture and language around risk. What is risk tolerance? What is risk appetite? What is the role of the board of directors and the oversight bodies? I can tell you this, this is a body of knowledge that is ripe to be advanced within an organization by professional management accountants. We do a lot of research in this area. There's a lot available through IMA and through our relationship with COSO. Uh, COSO, many of you know, is the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations. Um, it was formed back in the late 1980s in response to some uh, uh, banking, savings, and loan frauds. COSO, as I said, is the Committee of Sponsoring Organizations. It's a consortium of five accounting associations, of which IMA is one, uh, the AICPA is another, the IIA, the Internal Auditors, is a third. And basically what COSO is responsible for as a voluntary organization is to advance practice and guidance and frameworks in three areas, internal controls, enterprise risk management, and third, deterrence and prevention of fraud. So COSO has developed uh, plenty of thought leadership, plenty of practical frameworks in all three of these areas. 
this graphic here just kind of lays out in one big graphic um, all of the different areas COSO has looked at. Generally speaking, the COSO resources are available free to IMA members. Uh, COSO's website is www.coso.org. And again, IMA is a founding member and a very prominent member. Now, internal controls, uh, where COSO started back in uh, 1992, as we uh, launched the second poll question. I think the second poll question. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, it's like anything else. Risk management taken in isolation, uh, what the CEO or the sales manager could say is, oh, those CFO people, they're identifying all this risk. They're trying to slow down progress. That's the negative way to look at risk management in the CFO's role. The positive way to look at it is if we integrate risk management, and in this case, internal controls, as being good for business, as being part of an integrated business process, then the CFO team, the financial managers become part of the business process. So in the middle there, you see the five elements, the five components of the 1992 COSO internal controls framework, which is global and available to any IMA member. The control environment in the middle is the tone at the top, the ethics, the values. Um, risk assessment, as we alluded to earlier, is the process of identifying, assessing, and treating risk. Control activities are those activities that help to mitigate risk to an acceptable level. In my example, segregation of duties in a small uh, enterprise. And then information and communication across the enterprise to outside stakeholders and monitoring is the risk current and are the controls to mitigate those risks still operating effectively. But you see the connected story here. On the far left, you see mission vision, value strategy, uh, objectives around financial reporting and compliance and operations. And the far right, reasonable assurance that your operations are effective and efficient, that you're complying, and that reporting is uh, reliable so that investors can make appropriate business decisions. And it looks like, um, wow, 82% of you are involved in internal controls in your organization, which is great. We get to the Q&A. Um, I have a feeling I'll, I'll have several questions on that topic. A little bit more, one or two more slides on internal controls because it's so important, so interconnected with risk management. Uh, the COSO framework that I alluded to is a three-dimensional cube in terms of describing the uh, dimensionality and the comprehensiveness. It was first published, as I mentioned, in 1992. And it's a framework that's used around the world. You see the dimensions there um, down, starting with uh, control environment working up. Those are the five components, the five uh, areas where there's guidance and examples and how to do it type of thing. The other two dimensions in the three-dimensional cube across the top, you know, COSO has, people think of COSO as only applying to external financial reporting because 98% of U.S. publicly traded companies use COSO for Sarbanes-Oxley attestations. But the reality is COSO is never meant to be uh, siloed into just external financial reporting. It is also meant to provide guidance on operations, internal operations, as well as compliance with national, state, and local regulations. Um, now, the 1992 COSO framework, uh, which is readily available to you as members, is being refreshed. Um, it's been 20 years. An awful lot has changed with technology, with governance, with globalization. Um, there is an exposure draft out on the website. If you look there at the link, uh, IMA has been very active in developing this new framework. But of course, due process says that we want to hear from the market. Um, so uh, you have a, another full day <laughs> if you haven't, uh, if your company or you individually, but, uh, and by the way, uh, being a former COSO board member of comments came in a few days later, uh, they would still be accepted. And this has, this information about COSO has been on the IMA website and through various, uh, IMA email blasts. So let's talk about budgeting and planning the next major domain. You know, when you think about FP&A, you know, financial planning and analysis, budgeting, we've been doing budgeting since the beginning of time, if you will. 
Um, and yet it is still one of the primary areas that CFOs say they're not satisfied. Uh, why do they say they're not satisfied? Well, we did a research study not long ago, and I'm not gonna read every bar here, but here are some of the reasons why budgeting gets criticized. Too time consuming. Um, you know, it seems like we're developing budgets and plans the whole year. What about time to execute and implement the plan? Uh, budgeting tends to be slow and reactive and not forward-looking and sort of leading indicator driven. Reliability for performance measurement comes into play. The fact that if you're spending all your time budgeting, it becomes out of date. The disrupting of cooperation, the internal negotiation. Uh, how often have you been involved with an internal negotiation about a, an expense target as opposed to talking about envisioning how this organization can grow and create greater market share with new investments and new innovations. So as opposed to stretching for the future at a total level, we oftentimes get involved in internal department to department bickering. Uh, so that says that this is an area that is ripe for improvement. There are no easy answers, but as management accountants learning about FP&A and testing FP&A on the exam, we know that um, there is some opportunity to do better. So <clears throat> planning best practices, again, this is a very much quick hit. Um, an awful lot more on this could be talked about. But the first thing is that the strategy comes first, then the budget. So develop your long range, four year, 10 year strategy first, and then the budget with all of the detail and the expense levels that becomes year one of a multi-year story. Number two, as we talked about earlier, risk management should be integrated into all levels of the strategic plan. As a management accountant, as CFOs, ask the question, what risks are there? What if this um, competitive environment or this new product launch doesn't play out as we expected? Uh, what is the scenario that allows us to deal with that? Number three, data and predictive analytics. You know, I know a lot of folks um, don't want to become uh, doctorates uh, or, or master's degree candidates in statistics, but there are some basic techniques out there that we as business analysts should be using to develop more robust forecasts with explanatory variables and things of that sort. Number four, look, 70% of all strategies fail because of lack of execution. So build a monitoring process that intervenes where necessary when you're developing strategic plans. And this relates to number five. A rolling outlook says, look, if I'm uh, two quarters through the year, the rest of the year is just the rest of the year. It's two more quarters. Yes, it impacts my budget commitment and perhaps my bonus, but let's go out several quarters. So many organizations, for example, will develop a six-quarter rolling outlook. At any point in time, irregardless of when the budget cycle begins and ends, I forecast six quarters out. So I get a sense for the rhythm of the business, what's out on the horizon. I don't develop this rolling outlook forecast at a very detailed level. I just develop it at a level that gives me insights into new initiatives or divestitures or reallocation of resources. The CMA body of knowledge is very prominent. Uh, in this area of scenario planning, sensitivity analysis, simulation analysis, and we actually test that in part one of the exam because it is that important. I commented uh, the other night on this at the uh, live event uh, here at Open Thinking, and I said, you know, it's interesting when we're trying to predict revenues or cash flows four or five years ahead, we think that we're adding accuracy by um, reporting these forecasts to five decimal positions. We ought to be spending our time developing scenarios that's, that incite conversation with the leadership team, with our internal clients, maybe even with our board of directors. What if the global economy uh, doesn't grow? Um, the forecast here in Dubai is that there'll be uh, economic growth, I think I read uh, 5%. What if 2% plays out? What does that mean for my particular industry in retailing or in construction? Um, now, at the end of the day, you have to pick one view to present to your shareholders, to your board, to your investors, but at least it helps to frame the conversation and get to a point estimate that
that makes more sense and has been appropriately vetted. Uh, strategic cost management. This is kind of where many of us started as management accountants, uh, and in fact, where IMA started almost 93 years ago. So I define strategic cost management, um, and notice I use the term strategic. I'm trying to jazz it up a little bit. Um, yes, standard costing is often unit cost times units of production equals cost. That sounds kind of boring. Um, what I just described is standard unit cost. But there are methods uh, that are much more advanced than standard unit costing that includes activity-based costing, also tested on the CMA, RCA or resource consumption accounting, lean accounting. But the bottom line is that strategic cost management is really part of a broader performance management process. Yes, it converts usage quantities, demand units, uh, cost drivers, et cetera, into monetary units. But the objective is very much connected to business success. The objective of doing costing, as unsexy as that sounds, is to drive decisions on optimization, resource allocation, pricing and profitability for products, customers, services, and even geographic channels and, and uh, distributions. Um, actually, my colleague, Jim Garoka, and I, uh, Jim, as many of you know, is uh, head of uh, international business development. You've seen him and met him many times. Uh, Jim and I co-authored an article. It's actually going to be seven years old. But we talked about the fact that CMAs, management accountants, are familiar with many costing tools and how and where they apply and some good practice criteria like causality, um, like variable and fixed costs and understanding the relevant ranges over which a variable cost becomes a fixed cost and vice versa. Knowing that there are different methods out there well beyond standard unit costing. So although this article is going on seven years, we were concerned that there were so many methods out there that it was really confusing for the everyday practitioner. And then I'm going to um, begin to wrap up here. I think we're doing well on time. You know, the softer skills. Um, we had the chapter event here a couple nights ago, and I delivered essentially the same presentation, and Iyad delivered a uh, presentation on uh, financial leadership, softer skills, managing upward, managing your boss. And, you know, leadership is such an important element at any level uh, of the organization. And that's because we are advisors. Uh, we are business partners. We don't just sit in the corner and develop um, reconciliation reports and actual to budget variants. Now, that might be a good chunk of our day because somebody has to do the technical analysis. But the reality is that more and more over the years, globally, management accountants, CMAs are getting out of their cubicle and going into the meeting to describe uh, this month's variance analysis or sitting down with the controller and going through the reconciliation. Or as they advance up the value chain, uh, sitting down with their CFO or the board of directors to describe a multi-year business case to launch or not to launch a new product. So the ability to sit across from the table uh, from a, a, a client, an internal or external client who is not a finance professional, to have some give and take conversation, to perhaps influence their thinking, to be a good leader, and ultimately for the organization to come ahead is where these leadership skills are absolutely vital, these quote unquote softer skills. So that's why IMA has spent a lot of time in the area of financial leadership. And um, one of the articles I wrote, because this is an area I'm very passionate about uh, careers and differentiation and technical topics. Um, I've been a management accountant uh, for 30 years, and I'm proud of it. Um, but I'm very passionate about risk management and planning and budgeting and costing, as you can tell. But I'm probably more passionate these days about financial leadership. So I wrote this article, I think it was in 2008. Um, I got some uh, good feedback from IFAC, which is the International Federation of Accountants. And uh, this is in Strategic Finance, which is our award-winning magazine, of course. And one of the things, oops, one of the things that we uh, launched, and this is, I think, my last or second to last slide, 
um, in the IMA about two years ago was a leadership academy. Um, Le leadership Academy are webinar courses. They're online, 90-minute courses. They're generally offered at 1 o'clock Eastern time, um, they, which, which I believe, you know, generally speaking, uh, you guys are eight hours ahead. So these webinar courses, um, there's about 24 different courses on the softer skills. They're free to members. Uh, if you sign up for the live event and participate, you get uh, free continuing education credits. And you see some of the topics there, they're a little bit hard to read, but coping with change, advanced teaming skills, coaching, mentoring. Uh, we also have a mentor program. Right now we have many more mentors who are willing to give the advice than mentees who uh, are receiving the advice. Uh, there is, we can show you the link there. I think it's uh, down at the lower left. But the Leadership Academy, in terms of the webinar courses, once a month, they're great, they're free. Uh, it's a great opportunity to learn and grow. And then IMA does have a mentoring program. We're trying to make it more local. Um, but the reality is that mentoring could come across the ocean, across a couple continents. Uh, technology is no longer a barrier. So just to wrap up here, and then we'll begin to take uh, questions. Um, my last slide is oops, just a, um, a little bit of an inspirational slide um, where we've uh, done our salary survey a year or two ago. Although there's not a direct cause and effect, our salary shows that, uh, generally speaking, people in the Middle East across different age groups and countries, uh, whether you're male or female, earn significantly more by being certified. Again, it's not like you get certified and you go into your boss and say, here's my certificate, where's my uh, doubling of salary? But the reality is that by being certified, the data shows that it gives you access to broader career opportunities. At the end of the day, certification is just a means to an end. It's up to you. It's up to you to create the success story. So in closing, um, that is the last slide. In closing, my three themes that I started with, I'm going to close with, and then I think we're in good shape for questions. Number one theme was CFOs, financial managers, CMAs, management accountants are the go-to people, especially when times are tough. Number two, organizations are especially now looking to differentiate themselves and create enhanced organizational capability because of the challenges of competition, the global economy, and getting the right talent into their organization, especially on the finance team. And number three theme at the individual level, um, it's up to you, it's up to us as individuals to create our own success story and contribute to our organizations. Certainly certification, certainly uh, getting training and education, certainly being part of the global IMA community are means to those ends. So thank you very much. Thank you for participating. And we'll now open it up uh, officially to questions. So thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, please write it in the question and answer. We are getting all your questions. And after that, we are selecting you know, the questions that are relevant to this presentation and we are answering them. So let's start with the first question. You know, it looks like from your presentation that COSO model is like developed over all these years from like just the COSO model to the enterprise risk management. Where do you see the future for the COSO model going? Okay, great question. The, the future of the COSO model, um, I think two things. One is I think the COSO model um, is going to become increasingly global. Um, and certainly in the uh, refresh of the internal controls framework, uh, when we had the project team together, uh, if you were to compare that project team to 1992, I was not part of the 1992 process, you will look around the table and see representatives from around the world uh, contributing to the development of this new framework. Now, you could argue that internal controls is internal controls, whether it's in the UAE or in Beijing or in the US. But the reality is that um, the application of the internal controls, uh, the role of the board, the role of the audit committee, the role of management could very well vary uh, region to region around the world. And then the second 
future direction that I see is better connecting risk management and internal controls in achieving strategic objectives. Right now, COSO has this internal controls framework, which as I said, is being refreshed. It has a separate uh, enterprise risk management framework that was developed in 2004, if you remember one of the early graphics. So the ability to connect these two together, they really are two sides of the same coin uh, when you think about it. You know, once I identify a significant risk, a material risk to achievement of business objectives, I want to know how to treat, how to manage that risk to an acceptable level, and an internal control could be one risk treatment. So they, they really are connected. So going forward, we've got to do a better job uh, in COSO to connect risk management and internal controls. Thank you very much. Now we have another interesting question. What do you think are the most critical skills for you know, management accountants to have you know, currently for them to be able to play a much better effective role in their organization? Great question. So from a skills perspective, um, it really is as simple as saying there's a range of technical skills and some that we need to enhance and, and redevelop like merger and acquisition type of activity, like planning, like scenarios. But again, I can't emphasize enough the softer skills. Now, we don't test softer leadership skills on the CMA exam. How, how would you do that, right? But that's why it's important to supplement your knowledge. And some of this is going to come about through experience. Some of this is going to come about by volunteering for assignments. Uh, some of this is going to be, you know, we have a great local chapter here. Uh, Kareem heads up the local chapter. What about volunteering to be on the chapter board? Uh, what about seeing uh, if a local university would be interested in starting a student chapter? These are all ways to volunteer and develop leadership skills in a volunteer environment. You know, you can't fire volunteers. What a great way to develop and learn leadership skills and succession planning, and then go to the job and apply those leadership skills. So those leadership skills, those uh, influencing skills, those negotiating skills, and I would argue having you know, moved through the ranks and having mentored many students, that leadership applies at every level of the organization, not just from the top. In fact, as CEO of IMA, I expect everyone uh, that works for me uh, to be a leader. I, I expect the person that is um, you know, doing transaction processing to not only process transactions so that we, uh, we, we get your services and your, your, your uh, refunds or your payments processed, but I also expect that individual to take a step back and say, you know, I see an opportunity for improvement here. If we do X, Y, and Z, we can increase the accuracy of our transactions to our customers slash members by 10% and maybe even keep the cost the same or lower. I expect that level of leadership. Thank you very much. At the same time here in, in uh, you know, the local chapter in Dubai, we have so many opportunities for you if you would like to volunteer and we are working on so many great projects. One of them is happening soon in June, which is the CMA Challenge. It's a really big event and we need your help. So if you would like just to go to the website and just, you know, uh, uh, submit your information so we can have you uh, as one of our, like, uh, you know, member team for volunteer. Now, another question that we have is a really interesting question. How do you see the future or and the value of the CMA exam compared to other certifications in the market? Oh, really good question. Um, you know, of course, you would expect the CEO of the organization to be um, very optimistic. Uh, I am very optimistic, but I'm optimistic because I see results. I'm optimistic because I see passion. I'm optimistic because I see great local leaders uh, at the volunteer level, uh, like in this room here, uh, Iyad and, and Kareem. Um, and I'll, I'll be a little bit more specific, but um, when I look at uh, how far IMA has come in the last three or four years, starting at the top, when you look at every KPI or key performance indicator, uh, we are doing very well. We're still relatively small, um, but sometimes smaller enterprises can be more agile, can have a greater sense of community and service. Uh, of course, if you get too small, then you're not able to fund new things, new services, free webinars. Um, the last three or four years, we've done very well financially. 
uh, our balance sheet is very strong. That allows us, as I said, to fund new products and services at affordable prices for members. CMAs and CMA candidates are growing around the world. Uh, we absolutely need to increase our awareness. This last budget year, IMA increased its marketing spend in the region by 300%, but we need to do more. Um, we actually recognize that. We just had a great meeting while we were here with our internal staff uh, here in uh, Dubai. And we have some pretty exciting plans to go very, very deep and broad in social media, uh, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, uh, through the chapter portal, et cetera, et cetera. So we believe we have a unique value proposition. We believe we have strength of character and community at both the global and local levels. Uh, I'm a competitor. I grew up in telecommunications uh, for 24 years. I know how to compete. Um, IMA knows how to compete. And if uh, an organization like the AICPA decides to team with SEMA from the UK to launch, let's say, a, a global management accounting credential uh, like they did, you can bet that we are going to compete. Uh, we are going to differentiate ourselves. We are going to do all the things that we say others should be doing. We're going to innovate. We've got many new products um, in the hopper. Uh, we have partnerships that will be announced to broaden our awareness and our portfolio. Uh, the announcement with ACCA is just one example. Uh, but we need your input and we need your engagement and we need that local passion and engagement in order for us to be successful. So I'm very optimistic, but we have to take a very, very hard-nosed business approach to running uh, this global association. Thank you very much. I believe the CMA certification can speak about itself. It's one of the most valuable certification in the financial and accounting world. And one of the questions that we have related to that, looks like 20% of the attendees, they are planning to take the CMA exam. So could you give us any updates related to the new changes that will happen to the CMA exams or, and what are these changes? Well, the CMA exam uh, changed uh, just about two years ago. Uh, I believe it's been two years. Uh, it seems like time has really moved fast. It used to be a four-part exam and we converted it into a two-part exam. We don't expect any changes to the exam itself. Um, I, I can't promise for how long, but we don't expect any changes uh, to the current exam curriculum uh, and content, let's say, for several years because we don't want to be changing the exam every two or three years. You know, we want to update it when it makes sense relative to the market. Uh, very high level, though, you know, we did get some criticism, and, and we understand it, that said, gee, and going from four parts to two parts, you're watering down the exam. Uh, how are we going to compete with SEMA and ACCA, which have 14-part exams? And the answer is really very straightforward. We predicted that by developing a more rigorous, I'm sorry, a more relevant and focused exam, where we focused everything into two parts, uh, we actually predicted that the throughput would increase in terms of CMA candidates and, and CMAs, but the per part pass rate would actually go down a bit. And that in fact happened. I actually, as a CMA candidate a few years ago, started in the four part exam, converted to the two part exam, and both four and two part were equally you know, rigorous and challenging but we did see the pass rates drop a bit, and that is owing to the fact that we have more C-type questions. Um, you know, each of the two parts, even though there's two parts, each of the two parts has five major study domains with over 500 learning outcome statements each. We spent over two years going to the market before we developed this two-part exam, talking to CFOs, talking to controllers, uh, doing some independent research. So we have an exam that we know and the market is telling us is rigorous, relevant, and focused. Um, the SEMA exam is um, you know, a respected exam. Um, it's a 14-part exam. Uh, 
Uh, we believe our exam is at least as rigorous, but more focused. And uh, that's the strategy that we're going to continue to pursue. Now it's all about creating awareness. Uh, create, help us become uh, more aware to corporates and to universities. Uh, spread the word about the local chapter and local chapter events. Become a CMA ambassador. Go viral. Um, and that's the way that you can become part of the solution. Thank you very much. I believe also the CMA exam is just you know, the beginning for you. So just you need to start taking the CMA exam and after that, you know, try to play more important role in the accounting uh, and like financial professional by implementing